I guess this is going to be the closing keynote. I hope you can hear me OK with your funny headphones. So thank you all so much for being here. And welcome to my talk on library development, the DroidCon Turin 2018 edition. So my name is Lisa Ray, and I will be presenting this entire talk in the style of the comic XKCD, because I'm a huge fan. Uh, it's such an honor to be back here for the second year, and honestly, just to get out of the US for a little while. <laughs> so we'll have to see if they let me back in. Uh, if you don't know me, and I don't know why you would, uh, I've worked as an Android developer all over the US. Um, I've worked at Google. I worked at the New York Times. I built the Rap Genius Android app. And I currently work for a little startup called Present in San Francisco. I am so sorry to say this. I'm sure you're all sick of hearing it. But our app is not yet available outside of the US yet. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. This is my Twitter handle, so feel free to tweet at me if you're enjoying my talk. If you don't like it, just keep it to yourself. But enough about me. We're here today to talk about libraries. I make libraries, and I use libraries. And as a developer at my second startup in a row, and the sole developer of two Android apps in a row, I do have a lot of experience with libraries. And that's because I'm personally responsible for selecting everything, starting from file new project, and picking everything that makes it into the final app in the Play Store. As we all know, your app starts out looking like this. And pretty soon, it looks like the Magna Carta. That's because I also rely heavily on libraries. At a larger company, you might have an internal library that does something you want. Or you might prefer to get it just exactly right by having an internal team build it for you. Uh, or there might be licensing issues to consider. At a startup, I do not have that option. So if there is any semi-reasonable solution out there built by someone else, an image cropper, an auto filler, I had better use it, because my time is precious. So I spend a lot of time searching out, vetting, and choosing open source libraries. And sometimes suffering with them. Yet, it's one thing to use a library, which has a pretty clear benefit to you and your app. And it's another to write one. To be totally honest with you, I'm a bit of a selfish person about my time. Uh, if I'm going to do something for free, I feel like I'd rather volunteer with puppies or something and not be writing code. So when I was first introduced to open source, my honest first reaction was, why do this thing for free on the internet? It's really easy to understand the value of community and free open source software as a consumer, but I couldn't see at first how participating could benefit me. Even if I had to write something myself, why go to the bother of sharing it? It seemed like work for no reason. But after thinking about it for a long time, I've come to believe that writing a library is a task that truly benefits both you and the community. So here's how I envision your self-interest. This is the bubble of self-interest. And since you are part of the Android community, whatever is in your self-interest is, by definition, also in the realm of community interest. Done. And I made this self-interest bubble so big because you are almost certainly not the only person with your problem or your particular concern. In this case, it's a good thing that you are not a unique or special snowflake. So if you name the weirdest Android problem you've ever had, I bet five other people in this room have had that problem too. And sharing your work is a great way to discover that you're not alone. So back to that library that we're writing. We've established you're not alone, but what is it about writing a library that's in your self-interest? In a way, making a library is a little like joining a startup. It's probably not going to make you rich or get you famous. But it can pay off in really surprising ways. It can't grant you equity, but it can have a lot of other benefits. The first one 
which is a really immediate bene benefit to your app, is modularity. So we all know that modularity is an important part of software design, especially at scale. Well, it doesn't get more modular than changing parts of your app to an externally published Maven dependency. <laughs> so if it's hard to extract parts of your project, it probably means you needed to do this work really badly. And modularity is a good thing to start focusing on from the very beginning to avoid that. And it's a really good reason to consider making parts of your project into a library, if possible, from the very beginning. Community help. So in case this sounds kind of hippie to you, I'll translate. This means other people are going to write your code for free. It's awesome. So I have an example for you. I had the great opportunity to spend last summer between jobs doing some contracting work for the, um, my former team at the New York Times. I was there over the summer, and they had actual interns, like young people. So it almost felt like being a really senior intern, like a really old one. It was fun. And one of the things that I saw over that summer was that the server team wanted to start using GraphQL in order to be able to provide more efficient, more personalized queries for the mobile apps. Making things more efficient for the mobile apps is always something I can get behind. But Facebook didn't provide us an Android client. So the New York Times, Shopify, and several other companies all worked together to develop an entire new client library. None of us individually would have had any of the time required to do this. But by splitting the work, we were able to accomplish it together. It's actually being used in production right now. And that could never have happened without collaboration from a community. Uh, these are some extremely realistic likenesses of my coworkers and top contributors based on their GitHub photos. And I'm positive they don't mind. Another reason to write a library is sometimes just bare necessity. Sometimes I simply need this library, and no one else has written it. In this case, I need this library, but maybe none of the alternatives are acceptable to me. I'm about to go over the multi-dex limit, and the next library is just too big. Uh, or there's one available, but it's not at the level of stability or security that my app requires. Whatever. Sometimes you have to make it yourself. And I think in that case, knowing you have a single use case, the best alternative may be to start it as a library rather than later yanking it out of your app. Another reason to make a library can be to learn something new. You don't always want to do this on the job. Sometimes your job doesn't always want you to do it on the job. Uh, so you want to learn Kotlin. You want to try out animations. A library can be a really good place to sandbox your learning. As we all know, learning can sometimes be a messy process. And sometimes you don't want to get your learning all over your code base. So you want to try and make a library. The next question is, what problem should you pick for your library? What problem should you solve? Well, I have selected a sample of differently sized problems that other people and organizations have chosen to address. The first one being Android. Why not? It's open source. So if you're Google and you employ 60,000 people, you can make an operating system. A pretty good one, by the way. Thanks, guys. Uh, if you're Facebook and you have 17,000 people, then you can go ahead and try and replace parts of Google's operating system. <laughs> uh, JetBrains, 700 people. Maybe a new language, also pretty cool. Square has 600 people, and they've produced the most popular networking libraries for Android, along with a lot of others. And then this is you. So in case you couldn't see that, this is you. You are a tiny, insignificant dot in the middle of the universe. And so for your library, you should probably pick something else similarly small. 
In case you are still worried that picking a project too small might make your library unimpressive, uh, I'd like to talk briefly about something called Parkinson's Law. You may have heard people throw into conversation the idea that work expands to fill all available time, which is absolutely true. <laughs> Uh, but this is, I found in researching for this talk that this was actually coined in 1955 in a comedy essay by a man called Cyril Parkinson in The Economist. So what he did is he measured the bureaucrats of the British Empire at various stages, seeing how many people worked in their organization and what they produced. And he came up with this formula describing the inevitable growth of an organization uh, the real takeaway here, and the funniest thing, is that he suggested, as you can see, this formula is completely independent of the amount of work they do. It just suggests no matter the size of the organization, it will always spend all of its time getting its work done. And so will you. Uh, so likewise, your library is going to expand to become exactly as complicated as it's possible for you to handle. Trust me. Uh, if you are lucky. If not, it will be too complicated. So start small. In addition, if you try and make a library, try and focus on a single use case. You should be able to state in one short sentence what your library does without using the word and. <laughs> a user should be able to use your library by copy pasting two things from your GitHub readme. A Gradle dependency import, number one, and number two, a dead simple example that will compile and run. This is the bare minimum, and it's amazing how many people don't do this, but I think this is truly the biggest key to success of your open source project. Make it dead simple to start and obvious what to do. This here is not what you want to do. So you can see to set up the coffee maker, I have to pick one of the preset types of filter. I'm one of the preset types of grind. Uh, and by the way, I apologize, but here we're making American-style drip coffee. <laughs> you also have to adjust the water temperature. Now, nobody, probably outside of Italy, knows what temperature you actually brew coffee at. So yeah, I had to Google this. Uh, so this is overwhelming to someone who just wants to get started making a coffee, any coffee. Uh, your library can provide deep customization options, but they should be a click away, like on your wiki page or further down the readme. The idea is to have sensible defaults. Make the library start with them, and then don't bother the user with them again. If the user wants customization, they will go looking, and they'll find it. Uh, so the one good thing this library is doing in this example is that it's using composition over inheritance. This would be an example of inheritance, of course. And you can probably see at a glance what the problem is. By needing to inherit from a base class, um, and of course Java is single inheritance, our coffee maker can either be coarse grind or it can be slow drip, but it cannot be both. And not to mention the number of variants we'd have to write for this library is just awful. So going back to the composition example, even better than having nice default presets for your library is delegation. In this case, instead of you having to anticipate and build all of the use cases of your users, which is literally impossible, I assure you, you can allow them to customize in whatever way suits them, whatever way they choose, because they can build the filter and so forth. You simply provide an interface for each option, which they can implement, and a sensible default. Uh, for example, Retrofit does a really good job of implementing this pattern. Feature requests. So when you get your first one, it's going to be really exciting because it means people are using your library. But they can also be their own type of problem. If your library gains any traction, you're going to inevitably start getting these. Um, for example, this issue where the user adds Add pasta cooking capability. I'm using this library to make spaghetti. OK. There is nothing wrong with using a library for something other than what it's designed for. In fact, thinking out of the box is sometimes what makes us great developers. 
so there's a couple ways you can handle this. It's fine to say, you're welcome to send me a pull request to implement this, but this isn't a need of ours. That's one option. Another option is you can just say no, as long as you're nice about it. People are never going to stop asking you for things with your library, but you can say no. In fact, you may be doing all of the other users of your library a favor if you say no to requests which don't serve the core purpose of the library, which in this case is making coffee. And finally, you can ask yourself, is my library flexible enough? Maybe it needs to be more flexible. If Julie can provide her own heater to the coffee maker, then you don't have to support or even know about what she's doing in there. Another really important principle about making open source libraries is to be your own user, first and foremost. We've all heard the phrase, eat your own dog food, applied to testing your software, meaning use your own product. And the same goes for libraries. Uh, you should use your own library, because if it's not good enough for you, then who is it good enough for, right? The other important part here is that I believe you should fulfill your own needs first. Um, why? Because, one, you're your own most dedicated tester. The more central this library is to the use case of your app, the more likely you are to support the library, fix it, maintain it, and keep it going. And finally, having a real life need rather than an abstract one will inform your library development in surprising and awesome ways. It will keep you focused, and it will push you forward. Honesty. This isn't something that gets talked about a lot, but I think it's an interesting way to look at software development. I think you should be honest about what your library does. You do see a lot of this stuff bragging uh, when you read some library descriptions. But this kind of stuff doesn't really tell us anything about the library itself. It tells us really more about the author of the library. So you want to be honest about your library's scope and about its size. It's fine to have fun with your description, but you know, keep it real. You, you are aiming for clarity here not salesmanship. If your library does what it says and it's useful, then people will find it. And you also want to be honest about your library's stability and its maturity. And the best way to do this is to use semantic versioning. Uh, there was a talk just earlier today by Maria Neumeyer in which she talked a lot about dependencies, and she also covers this. So check it out if you didn't see that already. I do know some people just generally think the number went up must be a new version. True, that's true. But if you're choosing the version number yourself, you should know what it means. And in very simple terms, the small number uh, means a bug fix or something tiny like that. The middle number means you've added new features. And the left number means you broke something. Or you're gonna, you introduce breaking changes for your users. The one great thing to note, which I didn't really know until I got into publishing my own libraries is about pre-release versions, like alphas and betas. First of all, it's perfectly OK, maybe even a good idea, to release your library as an alpha or a beta. It's a great way to get feedback. It's a great way to have people test your library for free. Uh, it's also a great way to get help to finish it. Just put it out there, get a couple other interested parties, and they may help push you to the finish line. Just make sure you say it's an alpha somewhere obvious. And make sure you label it uh, with a version number followed by an alpha or beta, meaning it's before that version number. So it's important to get it right. Otherwise, your users won't get those automatic update prompts in Android Studio. And the question of honesty versus salesmanship is definitely true on other sites on the internet, too. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but it's not just your library's GitHub. So for example, if someone is asking questions related to your area of expertise on Stack Overflow, please don't just advertise your library. It's annoying, and we've all seen this, and everyone hates it. 
Uh, what the user wants is for you to explain how making coffee works. So if you truly can't help yourself, then just mention at the end of the answer that you made a library. Sometimes that is truly helpful. In the end, if somebody wants to use a library that does what yours does, they're going to do this. They go to this site called Google, and they search for a library that does that thing. Don't worry. In the end, Google is really good at this. And finally, testing, everyone's favorite topic. It was never mine, but the first time that you get a pull request, you may be incredibly excited. I know I was. I'm not alone on the internet. But then you think, how do I know if this pull request works or not? You're going to have to pull down this contributor's changes. You have to test them manually in your example app. You have to try and verify the problem they're describing uh, and that it's actually fixed. This could take you a long time, and this is what I did at first. It made me begin to dread getting pull requests, to be honest. Except I no longer dread them, because now I have a robust test suite, and it's running on a continuous integration server. Some examples are CircleCI, BitRise, Travis, or any number of others that actually offer free, free accounts to open source projects. And they require little to no customization to get started. They will run your suite of tests on every pull request, and they will put a beautiful, big, green check mark on the pull request saying that your test passed. It goes a long way towards giving you peace of mind and letting you enjoy pull requests again. Not to mention tests are just a good idea anyway, but I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. They're great for collaboration. Ownership is another thing that I don't hear talked about a lot, but it's been something I had to think about in my journey between companies. Ownership of an open source library is something you need to think about, because it really changes. It depends on the license on the open source project, and it depends on your employment contract. So if you work at a big company, like Google, in my case, um, I used to work there, or Facebook, this question starts before you even start at the company. When you sign an employee agreement, in many cases, you are probably agreeing that anything you make at the company will legally belong to the company. Uh, in many cases, this doesn't matter as much as you think, because if it's a free open source project, you're not going to make money off it. And in the end, it doesn't ultimately matter whether the company owns it or you do. Um, so there's an option of releasing your personal projects and the company owns it. It may be no big deal. There may also be a process in which you can apply to get an exception, and you can get ownership if your library isn't important or doesn't seem like it will make money for the company, if it doesn't have commercial value. In the, the last case, which actually may be the reason you joined this company, is it may be a huge draw and benefit, could be to work on the company's own open source projects. For example, I'm sure we can all think of a few that Facebook and Google have, uh, which could be very interesting and wouldn't happen otherwise. Now, if you're working at a medium-sized company, you should probably read your employment agreement. It might include boilerplate language like this, saying that they own all of the work you do. Uh, but you can probably negotiate it if that's important to you either to exclude all of your existing open source projects so that you can keep maintaining them, uh, or just to exclude open source in general, or just to leave it out. Sometimes all you have to do is ask. It also might not have any clause like this at all, but to find out, you have to read your contract. So it's worth doing. Now, if you work at a startup, which is my current case, you should still make sure it's OK but they probably don't give a shit what you do, <laughs> as long as you're rocking your main job. Your biggest problem is that you may not have any time to work on open source projects, because your startup job may consume your whole life. That's certainly the problem I have. And competition. Competition is something to think about also. So you've considered your edge cases, 
You've written tests for your library. You've approached open sourcing with honesty and integrity, and now you are basking in the attention of like 1,000 entire people on the internet. So exciting. Now, some other person made a library that does the same thing. Look, it has, it has a real icon that a designer made, unlike mine. It uses annotation processing or whatever's cool this week. It's even made by that same startup with a Polygon logo that's known for all its other Android libraries. Now, no one is going to use yours. Well, it doesn't mean you did it wrong. Sometimes, great libraries do seem to come out of the ether, and they are unique, and they do have a monopoly in the community. I think Retrofit is a good example of this. But that isn't always the case. Sometimes, there are many really well done, equally fine alternatives. For example, Square made Picasso, um, but then there's also Glide and Fresco. So at one point, the outward APIs of Picasso and Glide were so similar, you could almost switch your library's implementation by just doing structural find and replace. Why did anyone pick one over the other? Now, of course, uh, these libraries are actually different in various ways, not just in their size, but in their implementation and in the more subtle options. But more than that, no one needs to win when there is enough community support for everyone. Every Android app is downloading images, so that is a lot of market share, so to speak. Even if there are many libraries dealing with a topic, if none of them speak to you in their API, in their examples, it's OK to consider attempting a new version yourself. Just first ask yourself what's wrong to you with the existing alternatives so that you don't create duplication. If you think you can improve significantly, on the problems you perceive there, then consider making your own. And finally, deprecation comes for everyone at some point. So the moral here is not to expect immortality with your library. Especially if you are backporting something you feel is missing from the Android platform, it is likely that your library will eventually be deprecated by a first party solution. It may not happen as fast as you wish, but it's quite likely it will happen. The good news is, the smaller and more focused that you kept your library to start with, the less deprecation is going to hurt. It means that in the meantime, you successfully identified a need, and you made a useful contribution to the community. You solved a problem for which there was no other solution. Now there is. It also means you don't have to fix your library anymore. <laughs> you got a great experience, you learned a lot, and you made some connections in the community. All right, I'm sounding kind of hippie again, but you get the point. So if there's anything you take away from this talk, it's that a library you write, for mobile phones anyway, is one of the few places where the smaller the task you choose, the better your library will be. It's a really great place to practice your craft in isolation, away from the craft of a big project of your normal app. So if you're interested in getting your toes into open source and haven't tried before, I'd suggest you look inside your app and you see if there's even one or two places, a couple lines of boilerplate code you find you use over and over again, or it's a utils.java or an extensions.kt class that you wrote that you rely on, and you said, maybe other people will too. So you may think that your library is small and trivial, but we in the community thank you for making libraries that are focused and small. And finally, that you are not ever alone in this community. If you have a problem, I guarantee someone else has that problem too. Thank you very much.